Morning, everyone. Um, I'm reading from the book of Mark, chapter 1, <coughs> verses 9 to 13. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. Thank you, Angie. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Nathan. All truth, goodness and beauty comes from God. So let us ascend our minds to the true, incline our hearts to the good and open our souls to the beautiful. The painting on screen can be found on the walls of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican and was painted by the artist Pietro Perugino in 1480 and I selected it because it looks awesome. <laughs> We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Mark with the baptism and temptation of Jesus. In our passage this morning, we see Jesus, the Lord of glory and God of grace, begin his ministry as the Messiah, preparing to preach to everyone the glorious message of salvation and taking the next step in the greatest <laughs> rescue plan of all time which is the redemption of a hopelessly sinful world. Mark, the author, has already stated that John the Baptist has been preparing the way for God to come and dwell with his people. And at that time, there will be the message of comfort and judgment, hope and justice, deliverance and condemnation. John taught the people to recognize that the real enemy wasn't the Babylonians who took them into captivity several hundred years ago, nor was it the Romans who were at that time greatly oppressing them with extortion and brutality. No, John taught them that the real enemy was themselves, their own desires and passions, their own sinfulness and wickedness. Um, that is what separates us from God. He is our one and only good. This is to say, nothing can cut me off from God but myself. No other person than ourselves can make us give in to temptation, and no one but ourselves can make us rebel against God. This is the real problem in which everyone has fallen and cannot escape. The issue is not somewhere out there, it is in here. It is at this point when the greatness of the darkness has been so clearly revealed that the light of the world steps into the scene, or as John the Baptist states in another passage, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look at the passage in verse 9. We have the infinitely worthy Son of God, to whom is due all blessing and honour and glory and praise, being introduced as a man from Nazareth. This is incredibly important because Nazareth is not at all important. Or as one of the disciples said before meeting Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Think about the all-surpassing humility of God when he came down from heaven to earth in the person of Jesus. He came as a baby, not a man, born in poverty, not riches, born in a manger, not a palace, endured suffering and hardship, not pleasure and health raised in a tiny, forgettable town, not a large, popular city. And think about the greatest miracle ever to happen, 
the most reality-altering and immense event ever heard about in all the ages of the earth. Um, the fact that God became man, uniting heaven and earth, an act full of awe and wonder, beauty and mystery. And though this action was greater than anything that has happened or will happen, or will happen, only a couple of shepherds were told about it. This makes us reflect on the times that we have drawn attention to ourselves and boast about the things that we have done, especially when we're on social media. May God help us follow his example of humility. Now moving on to the second half of verse 9, we have a puzzling question set ahead of us. Why on earth was Jesus baptised? We know from earlier in Mark's Gospel that John the Baptist administered the baptism of repentance in which people confess their sins. But does Jesus need to repent? Does the spotless Lamb of God um, need to confess his sins? Does the sinless Son of God need forgiveness? Absolutely not. In Jesus, there is no darkness, there is no stain from sin, and there is no guilt of evil. He is perfectly pure and whole and righteous. So why then did he get baptised? There is an important principle to understand in the life of Christ. That is Christ for you. It always reminds me of a wonderful verse from the book of Psalms in chapter 56, verse 9. And it says, this I know, that God is for me. This verse couldn't be played out more beautifully than in the life of Christ, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was born of a virgin, who for us and our salvation grew up in an unknown life of poverty. He was baptised for us, endured temptation for us, performed signs and wonders for us, transfigured into glory on a mountain for us, and at the climactic moment of Jesus' life, he suffered and died for us. Then he ascended into heaven, where he sent the Holy Spirit and intercedes for us and for our salvation. Christ for us is especially evident from these verses we are reading today, seeing that Jesus got baptised even though he did not need to and endured temptation when it was within his power to avoid it. So Mark is making it clear from the outset that by being baptised, Jesus is taking our place and bearing our sins. He did not only take our place on the cross where he died the death that we deserved so that those who believe may be forgiven and reconciled to God. But also here, in the beginning of Mark's gospel, Christ's mission is clear that he has come to take our place so as to save us. And his baptism shows that Jesus is for us. In verse 10 and 11, we read, Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love, and with you I am well pleased. God the Father tore open the heavens. This likely refers to God speaking and giving a divine revelation, which in this instance is testifying to the fact that Jesus is the eternal Son of God, who existed before all time, and in whom the Father delights. As for the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus, 
we know that in the Old Testament, God gave the Holy Spirit not to save people as he does today, but to equip certain people for a specific purpose. For example, Samson received the Holy Spirit to give him immense strength, and Joshua was empowered by the Spirit to lead the Israelites into the Promised Land. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of proclaiming good news. So with the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the testimony of the Father, Jesus is ready to begin his several year ministry as the Christ, starting with the temptation in the wilderness. For us today, Jesus' baptism provides us great comfort because through faith, we share in all the glory of Christ. And God the Father speaks to each one of us, saying, you are my child, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. God is not pleased with us because of who we are or because of what we've done, but because of Jesus, who is the glorious Son of God. In verse 12 and 11, we read, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was um, in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels attended him. There are many great truths we can derive from this passage such as the role of the Holy Spirit in directing lives, or the ways in which we can overcome temptation, as detailed in chapter 4 in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. However, because of time, we can only look at the temptation of Jesus. But there is much that we can learn from this. It is important to establish one point before we talk about anything else, that is the question. Could Jesus have sinned given he is truly God and truly man? This is terribly complicated and will take a long time to explain, but here we go. The answer is no, of course he couldn't have sinned. Imagine if the God of the universe could rebel against himself or if the perfect Lamb of God could have become imperfect or if the Prince of Peace could be lawless, or if the light of the world could be filled with any amount of darkness, the wonderful joy of knowing Christ is that he will not fail, he does not fail, and he cannot fail. All that he plans comes to pass, and all that he promises is fulfilled. We don't trust in a saviour that could potentially be unable to save. Our eternal hope rests on the fact that Jesus does not sin. Because if he did, he too would be under God's wrath and we'd all be helpless. Please nourish your souls with the knowledge that Jesus cannot sin or make a mistake or do anything wrong. I know how easy it is for me to sin and fail the God that I love more than anything else. But praise be to God, he is unable to sin because he is the one who guides us and protects us. He is the one that pours out his streams of mercy and rains down his abundance of grace. He sends forth his overwhelming joy um, and pours out his steadfast peace. May you trust in him who is perfect in all of his ways. The next question always follows. If Jesus cannot sin, then why did the devil tempt him? I will make this one very clear to you. It's because the devil is an idiot. <laughs> who could have thought that picking a fight with the almighty, all-powerful God would have been a terrible idea? I would definitely not recommend following the devil's example. If we even think about the nature of God for two seconds, we realize that God does not change. He does not sin and he does not suffer. We cannot hurt God by attacking him. We can only hurt ourselves or those around us. 
But do not be complacent concerning the devil's foolishness in battling God. The devil knows his judgment is coming and that he cannot win, but he will try to drag down as many people alongside him into condemnation, along with all, with all the cunning deceitfulness of his demons. Another question arises, why did Jesus allow himself to be tempted if he is unable to sin? Much like in his baptism, this is part of the mission of Christ, that he is being tempted for us and for our salvation. We know how easily we fall to temptation and how quick we are to give in. We know just how many times we are overcome with the temptation to worry and not trust God, the temptation to be selfish and not love God, the temptation um, to respect sin and not fear God. These are just a fraction of the temptations we fall to every day of our lives. But Jesus, in all his glory and majesty, is showing us that where we fail, he succeeds. Where we are defeated, he reigns victorious. And where we trip and fall, he rises above and shines forth the pure radiance of his love. Mankind fell into sin in the Garden of Eden when Adam willfully surrendered to the temptation of the devil and ate the forbidden fruit. But though mankind rebelled in the garden, Christ perfectly obeyed in the wilderness as he began to redeem all things and make everything new by bearing the sins of the world and taking our place. And that is why Jesus was tempted, so that he could take our place as the righteous one for the unrighteous, the faithful one for the unfaithful, the perfect one for the imperfect, and the sinless one for the sinful. And now we have come to our last and most important question, which is really just all I've wanted to talk about. And that is, if Jesus is God and is therefore unable to sin, does this mean that he does not have a free will? That is, does God have freedom if he cannot sin? This question is crucial in understanding where we find freedom to live the lives that God has made for us. After all, he does not want us to be enslaved as we so often are. For this question, we must understand where we have gotten the concept of freedom wrong in the modern West. And it stems from the idea that freedom can be defined as a lack of restraint or the ability to do whatever you want. So where there are any restrictions or laws or rules put in place, then freedom is being restricted. And where there are more choices and options, then freedom is being increased. But this definition would have us think that since we as people are able to sin and God is unable to sin, then we have more freedom than God, which is absurd. Think about this illustration. A man has never touched a golf club in his life and now he wants to play golf. He knows nothing of the rules or even what you're meant to do. Does this man have the freedom to play the game of golf when he has no idea about the purpose or the end goal of the game and just stares aimlessly at the golfing equipment and waiting for something to happen? Is this man really free? It is only when someone comes along and shows him the point of the game and why they play and how they play that through discipline and learning, he is eventually free to play golf. The man finds freedom in purpose, not in choice, in doing what he ought, not what he wants. Or think about someone who wants to drive a car. They open the door, sit in the seat, and then what can they do? Click a couple of buttons, move the handbrake, 
press the horn a bunch of times and some more for good measure. They can't go anywhere and they don't have the freedom to do anything. And like in the last example, they must be disciplined and learn how to drive in order to have freedom to drive. Or think about, the skill, think about an artist. The skilled artist has the freedom to create something wonderful. But the unexperienced artist can't create anything, even though they both can do whatever they want, as they have no rules stopping them. So again, we see that freedom is found in purpose and not in doing whatever we like. These illustrations of golf and driving and art can be applied to our lives. It is only through learning to do the right things and knowing the purpose of life and knowing what God has made us to do that we can have freedom, which in the case of everyone's life is to glorify God by loving the creator and his creation. So it would be correct to say that free will is the power to be righteous. So then this means that righteousness is freedom and sin is slavery. We can now rightly understand that only God has complete freedom because he only does what is good and he cannot sin because if he did sin, then he would lose his free will. But as for us, when we live lives just doing what we want, there is no meaning or purpose. And when we live a life of pleasure through serving only ourselves, we become slaves to our own passions and desires. They control us and we are enslaved. There is no freedom in being a slave to your own desires. God has made you for a purpose. Aristotle says, I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies. For the hardest victory is over self. But we are unable to escape the slavery of sin unless Jesus sets us free. And we are unable to love anything unless we are first loved by God. But how can we know that God loves us? How can we know that he has come to set us free? Soren Kierkegaard, a 19th century Christian, tells us this parable. There once was a king like no other king. Every person trembled before his power. No one dared breathe a word against him, for he had the power to crush all opponents. And yet this mighty king was melted by love for a humble maidservant. He said to himself, how can I tell her that I love her? He first thought that he could demand her love, but he soon realized that if it's not freely given and freely received, then it is not love and they would be forever distant. Then he thought about taking her up to the palace, crowning her head with jewels and clothing her in royal robes. But how could he know if she really loved him back? He would live the rest of his days wondering if she only loved him because of what he had or if she was just scared to resist him because he's the king. Eventually, he realized he wanted a lover, an equal. So finally, understanding what it means to love, the king took off his robes to put on rags, gave up his kingship to become a servant, laid aside his palace to live in a room. This is how he showed a humble maidservant that he loved her more than all the treasures in the earth by giving up everything to win her heart. And we wholeheartedly believe that Christ has loved us in this exact way by leaving the splendor of heaven to walk among us, to teach us, and to die for us. He did this all because he loves us. He loves you more than anything else ever could. 
the tender warmth of Jesus' love is enough to heat even the coldest heart, and he has freely given it to you. You need only receive it by faith. So trust in him who died and rose again. That is the only path to freedom. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness. And thank you, Lord, that you have given yourself to us. Thank you for your great mercy in redeeming and forgiving a sinner like me. In you, O Lord, is forgiveness. And in you is life everlasting. You are hope and joy in all its fullness. May we trust in you, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.